So what we left the class with the last time was Compton scattering. I think I um, described this, um, the setup for it, but we didn't have time to actually do the calculations, right? Yes. OK, so let's uh, take a little bit of time to actually go through the calculation so that um, the, the end result we derive is actually surprisingly simple. Um, you can see in your textbook, you know, under chapter 6, the Compton effect. When you look at the, the end result that we are going to derive, let me just scroll down to that. It's a very simple relationship. Um, yeah. So, oops. Um, wait, did I go too far? Yeah. So this is the Compton um, formula. It's saying that, um, so this is the description again, Compton effect, or I guess Compton scattering. Um, so you have an um, electrode or some particle. You have some charged particle that has some mass, and the uh, light photon comes in, bounce, <coughs> bounces off the, off the particle, and you treat this like a, any collision between two particles. So the uh, photon particle of light hits this particle. After the collision, this massive particle is, um, let's say we are dealing with a head-on collision then this particle is moving to right with some velocity v, and light is uh, bouncing back after the collision, and, um, and this uh, uh, photon that's bouncing back has some amount of energy. The amount of energy it has can be related to its frequency. Its frequency can be related to the wavelength of light. So you have an uh, incident light wavelength and you have a reflected or scattered light wavelength. And what this Compton formula is giving you is the relationship between those two wavelengths. And so classically, what this should be is, classically, this should be 0. Because the way you would understand this classically is this elect oscillating electromagnetic field. The oscillating electric field shakes this. And that shaking particle re-emits this uh, oscillating electric, you know, uh, the electromagnetic wave. So classically, you would think these two should be the same wavelength. Uh, um, so this would be the result of what we call Rayleigh scattering or the scattering of light in classical context. And but what the experiment with the high, what experiments are showing. And what we can now derive using these quantum mechanical assumptions is that um, the wavelength will change. And that's a tide. And, um, and the only way to explain how this wavelength is changing is to um, say that the way we are going to describe the light now is actually the valid way of describing. Instead of thinking of this as an um, oscillating electric field, we need to think of it like a particle with some amount of energy. Yeah. So let me uh, set it up. And uh, I guess, so for this formula, they've done a very general derivation. So this theta is the angle between, um, it's the angle between the incident light, so I guess this direction, and the, the outgoing light. So right now what I'm doing is the special case of theta equals 180 degrees. So uh, I will do that special case. If you want to turn it into more general case, then you can do that by um, um, using vector notation. But uh, to make it conceptually simpler, for now, I will deal with the special case of a head-on collision where light bounces back straight. Okay. okay so, so you look at this like a collision between two particles. So you say, all right. Uh, we've been dealing with problems like this uh, in physics 4A and now in relativity. So what we are going to say is, um, so this is a collision that concerns 
energy and momentum. Right? So, all right. So let me write down the conservation law that says, you know, energy before collision is equal to energy after collision. And that um, momentum um, before collision is equal to the momentum after collision. Now, if you are starting backwards, <laughs> as in, you know, if you're starting from here, you might, um, you might forget to apply special relativity. Um, but because you don't see any factors of gamma here. And what I'll tell you now is that this is actually the relativistically correct formula. So to drive this exact relationship, you have to start out with relativistically correct expressions for energy and momentum. So let me do that. So um, for conservation of energy, what I would say is you know, energy before collision or total energy before collision is equal to total energy after collision, right? Um, so let me write down an um, um, actual expression for this. So in this picture, what is the total energy before collision? So let me take care of the new parts first. Uh, we have energy of the photon. So guess we have energy of the photon. Is that all the energy that we have in this picture before collision? What other energy do we have? Rest energy. Yeah, we have a rest energy of the electron. So all right, energy of the photon plus the rest energy of whatever the particle that is. I keep calling it electron because that's the most usual case. But the energy of the particle, so mc squared, the rest energy. All right, so that's equal to the total energy after. So here, um, since we are looking for the wavelength to change after the collision, we are looking for energy of the photon to possibly change. As I write down the energy of the photon, I'm going to use a different letter. Instead of F, just following the notation that they are using, I'll say F prime. Right? Because I'm, so if it turns out to be the same, then it will be F equals F prime. If it turns out to be different, then it'll, you know, if F won't be F prime. Plus, what's the, what other energies do I have in this after picture? So I do have rest energy of the particle still, but this is where actually the relativistic expressions look much simpler if you think of the whole thing together instead of breaking it up into parts. Because you know this says rest energy. What other energy does it have? Kinetic energy. Kinetic energy because it's moving, right? So if you are in your I don't know non-relativistic mindset, what you might be tempted into saying is that you might want to say for energy of this particle, you might want to say it's uh, m c squared plus one half m v squared, like you know, right into part rest energy and kinetic energy. And what I'm telling you is that in Special relativity, and you will notice it as you are working on the problem set that you do next Tuesday. This is unnecessary complication. There is actually a very simple expression for the total energy. Anybody? Anybody other than God you remember? So you are remembering this. Um, so what Javier is remembering is this relationship gamma minus one mc squared. This was not the total energy. What was this? Yeah, this was the kinetic energy. So if you want total energy, what would you do to this? Uh, I'm asking what would you do to this if you want the total energy? You would add the rest energy, right? Doing that just gets rid of this minus one. And so as Song Min was saying, if you are looking for total energy, that's a simply gamma mc squared. So this is one of the habits you kind of have to break. So in, um, in non-relativistic mechanics, um, 
it was simpler to deal with the kinetic energy alone, not worry about the rest energy. And that is just an artifact of the fact that you are using low speed approximation. Um, but really, the simpler expression is not one part of the energy. The simpler expression is dealing with the entire energy altogether. It's when you try to break it up into tiny little pieces that you, you get complications. So here, when you look at the energy of the after picture, so you know I could write it down as rest energy of the mass plus its kinetic energy. But what I'm trying to tell you is that it's so much simpler to simply write down gamma mc squared for the total energy. And this includes the rest energy. So you haven't forgotten anything. Yeah. All right, so that's a conservation of energy. I'm going to need that as I go through the algebra. Let me write this as one. Um, and I'm going to need the conservation of momentum. So just to write it out, um, so total momentum before is equal to total momentum after. Um, anybody here remember expression for momentum in this picture where the massive particle has zero energy, so zero momentum, sorry, zero kinetic energy, so zero momentum, and whatever momentum there is is in the momentum of the photon. What is the, um, what expression do we have for this? People remember? How, what is the momentum of light related to other things that we might have here already? What other quantities do we already have on the board? other than momentum, I mean. So you know, momentum is a dynamic quantity. We are looking for other dynamic quantities that we can relate to momentum. Energy. So how is momentum related to energy? Uh, Sorry, Sangmin, could you say it louder? I think you might be the, saying the right thing, but uh, I can't hear the whole thing, so. Yeah. So this is the relationship you should remember, energy-momentum relationship. Energy-momentum relationship that, um, so this is, we are still in relativity. Um, so energy squared is equal to, the, uh, I guess this is probably a better way of writing. The, the portion of energy that's related to its rest energy, mc squared, squared, plus the portion of energy that's uh, somehow tied back to its momentum, pc squared. So this is one of the things you should remember. So, you know, it, it, you should remember whenever you are dealing with the special relativity. Um, so for the before collision picture, we are looking at um, we are looking at all the momentum that's in the photon. What is the mass of the photon? Zero, Zero right? So for photon, light, a special relationship holds that E is equal to PC. Right? This is not the first time you're seeing it. We brought it up when we were driving this last time. Yeah. I mean, you know, I understand it doesn't quite, you don't quite absorb it until you have to use it in doing homework, and which just got posted yesterday. <laughs> um, but there's quite a bit of new expressions, new formulas that you have to know. If you're trying to escape by on what you knew from physics 4A, uh, doesn't really work. Even if you're trying to skip by on what you covered in your chapter five problems at A, that also doesn't quite work because that covers the kinematic, covers the Lorentz transformation, but things that relate to energy and momentum, they are rather specific about energy and momentum. So the momentum before, it would be the energy of the photon before, so H times F. I'm just trying to do some of the work already. Um, from the beginning. So um, energy 
divided by C, that will give me the momentum. So this is the momentum before. So the total momentum after, I have to um, account for momentum that's in the massive particle and momentum that's in the photon. And in this picture, um, the thing you have to worry is that, well, um, the particle is going that way and the photon is going this way. So, you're, um, so you have to write it as, um, um, so minus HF prime over C plus momentum in the photon, uh, sorry, momentum in the massive particle. Um, so I have to use the relativistically correct expression, uh, gamma MV. Any questions? All right. Um, so let's see if this is actually solvable. Um, we have one, two equations. Uh, how many unknowns do we have? Or actually, let me do it this way. Let me go through each of the letters and see if they're unknown. If they're unknown, are they new unknown? H, that's Planck's constant, so that's known. Frequency of instant light. Unknown, known? No, yeah. So anything that's initial condition, you kind of want to say, okay, that's known. Um, or you are just determining the experimental setup. So treat this as known. Mass of the particle, known. It's part of the setup. C, speed of light, known. Planck's constant, known. Frequency of the scattered light. So this is the first uh, unknown that we have written down. All right, gamma. Yeah, how, this is related to how much energy is in the scattered particle. So yeah, this is unknown, uh, and this is, those are all known. Um, so all these are known, F prime already counted, gamma already counted, what about this V? Yeah, so this, wait, is it free unknown or unknown? Or, let me rephrase it. Is it a new unknown or is it, um, you could have treated it as unknown but it's already something, part of something counted. Yeah, so this is unknown but it relates to gamma. So, um, as a matter of a habit, you shouldn't count, you should be in the habit of always counting V and gamma together as one unknown. Whenever you have one, you can relate to the other. These are the relationships you should have mem memorized. Gamma is a square, oops, one over square root of one minus V squared over C squared, or inverting that, V is equal to C times square root of one minus one over gamma squared. So because of this, you, can, you should be in the habit of always treating gamma and V as one unknown. So, um, so I always do this check to make sure that before I go into a bunch of algebra, this is solvable. I have two equations, only two unknowns, so I ought to be able to solve it. Okay. All right, um, so what should be my next step here? Like, so you know, okay, so you have two equations, you decided that you, um, it's solvable. You can solve for both of these unknowns. And um, as we do more of this complicated algebra, it becomes more important that you plan out your steps because otherwise it's uh, easy to do a bunch of mathematical operations that are not incorrect, but you are nowhere close to the solution. You want to be efficient in the <laughs> mathematical operations you're going to write down. So, um, so I don't know, somebody suggest the next step. What would you do next in our attempt to get at an expression that kind of looks like that? Use the gamma to represent V, to eliminate V first, as you told us. Okay, eliminate V, we could do that. Um, all right, so why not, let's do that. So um, I will just rewrite the second equation so that I'm plugging in this expression for, v, expression for V here, then it's going to be M times C, and I'm going to absorb this gamma into this square root. 
then it'll be um, it'll end up this equation will end up being this um, h f over c is equal to h f prime over c plus m c square root of gamma squared times one so gamma squared minus gamma squared times one over gamma squared so one all right this is just a bit of a you know tidying up the house which is good you should always you know simplify things along the way if you can um, but we are not really so okay so we now officially have only two unknowns well uh, we haven't uh, if Gauge hasn't yet answered the question of uh, strategically what we should do it, what should we do next? Because this is the kind of choice or flow chart or decision tree that you are coming down to. Uh, you have two unknowns. Which one do you want to solve for? That's really the decision you're trying to make. Like, what should the first thing do you do? Do you first solve for frequency, or do you solve for solve? Uh, do you first solve for gamma? So, what do you, how many here want to solve for frequency first? How many here wants to solve for gamma first? So, Kian, you are raising your hand for solve for gamma first. You're not sure why. OK. Someone who uh, has a reason why you want to solve for gamma first. Someone other than Gauger. Crystal, you're not sure? OK, when? Uh, why do you want to solve for gamma first? Uh, so you think this is square root will get in the way. All right, that's a, uh, that's a potential thing to worry about. And in fact, that is something that you will always have to keep in mind whenever you are dealing with a special relativity. Because of this, you are going to have square roots here and there. So that will always be a worry in the back of your mind. But here, I would say you want to solve for gamma in, for a more general reason. I mean, you know, think about it this way. Uh, you have a system of two equations, two unknowns. And it's not always the case you should solve for one rather than the other. Sometimes the choice is kind of equal. Like you could do either one and it'll be fine. Here, I would say the overwhelmingly better choice is to solve for gamma first. So why? Um, like, so this is under some situations. It just makes better sense to solve for one unknown rather than the other unknown. say some math, you start uh, from some difficult thing, some dodging thing, you end up with easy. If you start something... Yeah, yeah, that's the same reason when one you to solve for gamma because of the square root here. I'm saying that could be it, but I'm saying there is actually an even more overriding reason why you want to solve for gamma first. Let me ask a different question this way. Um, in a, so let's say you have a, two, a system of equations. Let's say, I don't know. Um, y squared is equal to x plus 1, and y is equal to x minus 1. This is your system of equations. x and y are your unknowns. Oh, sorry, 1 is already solved for, let me say, square root of y is x minus 1. Um, so if you are to, let's say, if you make a choice to solve for x first, by the choice, what are you also doing when you are going to try to say something? Yeah, if you solve for frequency, then the reason you did that was so that you can substitute it in. In the process of substitution, you are necessarily getting rid of that symbol. So whatever it is you are solving for, you are trying to eliminate it, right? So that's really the question you are trying to, that, that, that's the more direct question I could have asked. Which of these two variables do you want to eliminate first? Why do you want to eliminate gamma first? Because you don't see it here, right? <laughs> and if you go a little bit beyond that, you might realize that this wavelength is related to the frequency. 
So that's why we want to solve for gamma first here, because gamma is not in our final expression. In fact, so we are never really going to get an expression for gamma. We don't really want it anyway. So that's why we want to solve for gamma first. And what we are doing in the next set of algebra is eliminating gamma so that we end up with one equation in terms of one unknown that we are going to somehow try to put into this form here. Yeah? So this is the thinking process you need to go through before you write down anything. Because once you're at this level, there's just a bunch of different, there's 10 different things you can do. And of those only, less than half of the things you can do will actually contribute to getting to the final answer. That's why you need to plan it out. So our plan is let's get rid of gamma. Then the choice is, do I solve for gamma here or here? Um, tough choice. Um, I probably should have done this before class. I, I think I'm going to solve for gamma here. Because it's easier to do it here. And whatever it is expression that I'm trying to reach at will, I think I'm going to get to it as I'm dealing with this eventually anyway. So let me try doing it that way. And let's just hope that it works out. Um, so I'm going to solve for gamma here. So what that ends up being is, all right. Um, so move this over. So this gamma mc, gamma mc is equal to hf minus hf prime. And there's this plus mc squared still. And I'm going to divide out mc. So I end up with, um, let me do that in black, um, end up with this thing divide by mc. And when I have mc here, m's actually cancel out, and I get just a factor of c. Good. Wait, that doesn't sound right. Oh, mc squared. All right. So it should have been squared. So this should be squared, squared. All right, so this ends up being 1, which is what it should have been. Okay? So gamma is equal to this whole thing plus 1. All right? Um, I will, I guess when I plug it in, I'm not really plugging in gamma. I'm plugging in gamma squared. So my do is I'll do that here so that when I actually plug it in here, I save some space. So gamma squared is equal to this thing squared. Um, so do I want to write it all out? Uh, let me write it out this way. So factor out h and mc squared. So h over mc squared times f minus f prime. So when I square everything, this the whole thing is going to get squared squared. That's just this term squared. Plus, there's the cross term. That's going to end up being plus 2 times h over mc squared times just f minus f prime. And then plus 1 squared, which is just 1. Um, we see some simplification that's on the horizon. When I plug this in, this minus 1 will cancel out this 1. So it's, you know, and it's not looking as uh, um, hopeless as it might be. All right, let's keep going. So it's uh, this expression that I'm going to plug it in here. And then that will leave us with 1 one equation that contains only one unknown. And here, my goal really won't be to solve for f prime. That's not what I want anyway. I want to get something that looks like this. So after we write down the one equation, we'll do some side-by-side -side comparison and see what we need to do, get it closer to this. Yep. So, um, so I have, let, uh, let me do some pre-simplification. I'm going to move this over, and I'm going to divide it through by mc. So I have h, um, so, and I'm going to factor out h, see. So I have h over mc squared times f minus f prime from moving all of this over. And now I have square root of gamma squared minus 1. That's equal to square root of uh, this minus 1, so just to, uh, 
h over mc squared squared f minus f prime squared plus 2 times h over mc squared times f minus f prime. All right. Does this look correctly done? Plugging in, uh, plugging this into uh, this here. Yes? What sign there? Oh, oh, sorry. This was minus, right? So this should be plus. Thank you. OK, <laughs> does this now look correctly done? OK. Um, all right, um, so I think from here, the next two choice is kind of clear. I just need to square things. Um, I, I need to, yeah, I just need to square things uh, to get rid of the square root. So I'm going to square the left-hand side, square the right-hand side. And this time, I don't really have a good strategy or vision. So I'm just going to expand out everything and hope that something cancels. Yep. So let's see. So squaring the left-hand side, I get h squared over m squared the c to the fourth power times this thing squared, f squared plus 2f f prime plus f prime squared is equal to. So the right-hand side squaring just gets rid of the square root. But I should really expand this out now so that I see what I have. Um, h squared over m squared c to the fourth times f squared minus 2f f prime plus f prime squared. So that's this thing all written out. Plus um, 2 times h over mc squared times f minus f prime. Now you see some things cancel out, right? But um, it's not as complete as you might hope. So this cancels out with this. So let me cancel these two out. This cancels out with this. So let me do that. Um, but these two won't cancel out. I guess I can put them on the same side and make them add to each other. So I can do that, you know, get rid of this by turning this into 4, because I'm just adding them together. Right? So when you've done all that, um, oh, oh um, so all of these cancellations made this whole thing 0, right? So I can factor out, uh, oh, sorry, cancel out some factors. I have this h over mc squared. I have two of them here. So cancel out a factor out of those. So this h over mc squared is gone. Um, I guess while I'm at it, get rid of this 2. So this is now um, 2. Mm. All right, that was a lot of cancellations. Let me write down the intermediate step. And then we will, while we stare at it, we'll decide what to do from there. So um, here I have h over mc squared h over mc squared times 2 um, ff prime. 2 ff prime is equal to there f minus f prime. So wait, did I make a mistake somewhere? No, I didn't make a Wait. I feel like I made a mistake somewhere. I will see. Um, oh, no, no, I, I think I'm fine. <laughs> All right. So, uh, OK, this is why I was thinking I, maybe I made a mistake. I have f minus f prime. Here it says lambda prime minus lambda. But maybe that's OK. We'll look at that later. So as you look at this, does it look, is this look starting to look similar to this? Kind of. I have this h over mc squared. There's h over mc. Hmm, all right. I guess I will deal with that later. 
Well, okay, oh, let me actually start putting in some suggestions on what to do so that this starts looking more like that. So apparently one of the things I need to do is take this and multiply through by one over, sorry, multiply through by C, right? To get rid of MC squared. Um, and in that expression, H over MC is multiplied to a dimensionless quantity, right? This is, so with a special case of theta equals 180 degrees, this is going to end up being equal to two, which actually does fit our case here. But I don't want this F and F prime. So let me try doing that. I'm going to multiply through also by one over F F prime. So if I do all that, that's going to make this side correct, come out correct, right? And what I'm really hoping is, all right, let's just do, do this and see if, uh, if, the, if the other side comes out correct too. Maybe it will, maybe it won't, but it's something to try and see. Yep. All right, so let me do that. So I'm going to write down this first. So I have F. Multiply by C, divide by F, F prime. So that's going to be C over F prime. Yeah? C over F prime minus F prime times C divided by F times F prime. So that's going to be C over F. F prime cancels out. Right? That's the left-hand side. Right-hand side, or what used to be on the left side becomes by design H over MC2. So H over MC times two. What are these? Speed, wave speed divided by frequency. What is that? That's a wavelength, yeah. So in fact, these are lambda prime minus lambda is equal to H over MC times two. So yeah. That, that's the result. It's a surprisingly simple result. Even in the more general case, you know, for that derivation you can read the textbook, even in the more general case of this scattering at different angles, you see that um, it's uh, actually not that much more complicated. And wh what I will once again emphasize is that this surprisingly simple relationship is actually relativistically correct. It, because you can see from our starting uh, point of the derivation, we took relativity into account as we were writing down this starting point, and at no point we made any approximation, so this final result is the relativistically correct expression for this thing. Yeah, yeah. and I guess while we are on here, I'll point out, sometimes you hear people talk about the Compton wavelength. This is the so-called Compton wavelength. Compton wavelength. So someone could be talking about Compton wavelength. You can see that this is a wavelength because it has a unit of meter, right? Yeah. So people talk about Compton wavelength of an electron. And what that means is, you know, H and C are universal constants. It doesn't change the particle. You just switch out the mass for the mass of the particle. So there's a Compton wavelength of electron, Compton wavelength of proton, Compton wavelength of whatever. So, um, by the way, just looking at this, would you say proton has a, a smaller Compton wavelength or electron has a smaller Compton wavelength? What does your intuition tell you? I'm just looking at this. Everyone here knows what protons and electrons are? They're particles in an atom. Which one is heavier? Proton. proton. Anyone here happen to know by how much? A lot, but not that a lot. You, it's uh, something that you can say without a bunch of prefixes. By about a factor of 2,000. Proton is about 2,000 times heavier than electron. So as you look at this, which of those two should have a shorter Compton wavelength? Proton, whichever is heavier, right? So 
All right, yeah, so uh, while we have it here. So when someone talks about quantum wavelength, it's this particular combination of quantity that they would be talking about. And anything that has mass, you can assign a quantum wavelength to it. I can assign a quantum wavelength to this steel ball, except it'll be fantastically small. <laughs>